Hello, hello. This is the great Johanna speaking. Welcome to my live stream. I'm streaming live usually on TikTok. I do have a schedule. Try to do it every Tuesday at 8 p.m. Uh, UTC plus 2 West European time. But this one just popped up. I felt like doing another one. Um, I made a video for TikTok where I uh, had a list of like 30 books that I recommend for the right revival. And I want to go over these books and maybe read the, uh, I'm going to try to read uh, the descriptions from the Amazon book pages of these ones. And maybe basically guide you through uh, books that have certainly influenced my thinking. Uh, I keep track of the books I read using this app called Zotero. I've been doing this for like 20 years or so. Um, so I've read over 1200 books or so. Now, I don't think that's special. I know somebody who read more than 30,000 books. Like, wow, you must be very knowledgeable. One thing I do uh, know is if you happen to read over, say, around 1,000 books or so, it changes your mind. You, you become a very different person when you become so informed, so to speak. The books I've read were always about history or about philosophy or, you know, non-fiction mostly i do also read some fiction though i don't i'm not the sort of person who enjoys reading fiction i've never read harry potter for example but i've read other fiction books um it just depends on um, if it's really well written of course i would like to read uh, more fiction books right but a lot of authors i would say are not very good at writing so you have to be very careful what books you pick i usually uh, browse a book to see if if it is written well if it's not even written well then why should i trust that information in it is well thought out see so be careful with that um so i made this uh, list of books on uh, tiktok 30 books i recommend for the right revival so let's go to the first one Against the Grain by Professor James C. Scott. Against the Grain, A Deep State of Earliest States. This author also wrote another book that I did not include called um, uh, Seeing Like a State. And the combination of these two books, Seeing Like a State and Against the Grain, it informs you so much more about how civilization really developed. And it turns out civilizations never really developed for some kind of heroic purpose, but rather... You end up with too many people and you want to preserve their existence and you want to feed them and house them and you want to secure their reprodu reproductivity, really. So in the early states in the Mesopotamia, ancient Mesopotamia, for example, the early cities like Uruk or Ur or whatever they were called, these places at some point started uh, sending people out to kidnap women, they would drag the women into the cities and force them to work as free laborers, unpaid laborers, in these sweatshops where they would produce clothing for the other city dwellers. So a lot of what cities have done is really uh, against the freedom of individuals. And that is sadly the foundation of what we call modern civilization, uh, which comes with cities. So... I'm going to like go through the 30 books that I listed and I'm going to have I'm going to read some Amazon descriptions here and give my thoughts around it. So I'm quoting the Amazon description for this book against the grain. So why did humans abandon hunting and gathering for sedentary communities dependent on livestock and cereal grains and governed by precursors of today's states? Most people believe that plant and animal domestication allowed humans, finally, to settle down and form agricultural villages, towns, and states, which made possible civilization. The first agrarian state, says James C. Scott, were, was actually born of accumulations of domestications. First fire, then plants, livestock, subjects of the state, the citizens, captives, and finally also women in the patriarchal family. Now, all of which can be viewed as a way of gaining control of reproduction. Uh, I don't think patriarchal families were a product of sedentary uh, societies at all. I think that's perhaps mistaken. It may, may have been in existence alongside with it. I think the hunter-gatherers themselves may also have patriarchal families, uh, or at least pastoralists do. Okay, I'm not uh, the expert on this topic. But... James C. Scott emphasizes domestication as how civilizations got started. 
we domesticate plants, livestock, and then the people, the citizenry, are basically domesticated humans held captive by the walls. And so James Scott explains that modern civilization is not as heroic as what you would like it to be. Um, another book that I read was Anatomy of the State by Murray Rothbard. I thought this one really explains really well how states work. So it kind of links up with the, the other book, Against the Grain. Um, let me see if I can find uh, a summary for this. Here, Anatomy of the State. Murray Rothbard was known as the state's greatest living enemy, and this book is his most powerful statement on the topic. He explains what a state is and what it is not. He shows how it is an institution that violates all that we hold as honest and moral, and how it operates under a false cover. He shows how the state wrecks freedom, destroys civilization, and threatens all lives and property and social well-being, all under the veneer of good intentions. So you see that, you know, against the grain and this book, Anatomy of the State, they, they both really attack the idea of states and civilizations as being something good and beneficial, but rather make the case for it that we've all been enslaved by these things in these very complex systems. Now, I'm quite a radical in this sense. Yeah, I do feel that uh, I feel that the industrial civilization, urbanism, so is not as beneficial to human beings as we like it to believe, especially not in here in the spiritual psychological sense. So moving on to the next book that I put on the list. These are books listed for, uh, you know, for the right revival. Behold a Pale Horse. This is one of those strange, quirky books. Um, I liked it because it included a whole section explaining how, if you look at energy sources and energy cycles, why societies eventually must collapse due to internal problems. Basically, uh, if you know something about the law of diminishing returns, that's what this book contains a section that explains that really well. Let's see if I have a summary for this one as well. Behold a Pale Horse by William Coop Cooper, 1991, first published. All right, here. Bill Cooper, former United States Naval Intelligence briefing team member, reveals information that remains hidden from the public eye. This information has been kept in top secret government files since the 1940s. His audiences hear the truth unfold as he writes about the assassination of JFK, the war on drugs, the secret government, and UFOs. Okay, so I don't believe in UFOs, but like I said, this is a bit of a quirky book, but it contains a section that I thought was very useful about how the law of diminishing returns pre predicts basically the collapse of, uh, of our society. Uh, there's another book that I did not put on this list, but I'll mention it anyway. There's a book called uh, The Collapse of Complex Societies by Joseph Tainter, Professor Joseph Tainter. You might want to look, look that one up as well. Uh, Angelus Silesius, yeah, uh, the Carabinic Wanderer, mystical poems probing into the relation of God and man. I really enjoyed this book. It's poetry, short poems, like four-line poems and so on. Uh, let me see if I can find more information about this guy. This guy gives you a very interesting um, sense of what God is. He says that um, in one of his poems, he describes, for example, uh, I am as high as God and God is as low as me or something. It may, basically, he changes the relationship between man and God as something that is not hierarchical, but it is more equal, which I thought was, of, of course, very interesting anyway. Um, let me see if I can read something about this. The Carabinic Wanderer, the book, uh, over the decades has become an integral part of German religious folk literature. Admirers such as Friedrich Schlegel in the past century and others uh, have prized the work for its power, its immediacy, and its beauty of expression. Yeah, uh, I thought this was definitely uh, an interesting book to read. All right, let's move on to the next one. This is a bit of a religious thing. Of course, the classic by Goebbels, Communism with the Mask Off. Here, uh, and what is so strange about this book? Well, strange. What is so 
um, interesting about it is that it describes the reality we are living in today. In like in the 1930s, this was a threat that they wanted to ward off. But today we are living in it. And a lot of what he describes in this book has simply become reality. Let's see if I can find something of a, of a review of this on Amazon. I'm not sure if they have it on Amazon. They do have it on Amazon, but it's without the description. Okay, well, anyway, I'd recommend this book if you really want to have some proper arguments against, uh, you know, communism. I suppose TikTok doesn't have a problem with it. <laughs> ah, yeah, this book. I love this book. Death Object, Exploding the Nuclear we Weapons Hoax by Akio Nakatani, a Japanese author. So, uh, the author of this book maintains that nuclear weapons aren't real and that what we saw at Hiroshima and Nagasaki was really uh, a carpet bombing with napalm firebombs. They basically burnt these towns to the place and they did the same thing to many other Japanese cities. You have to imagine it this way. In the 1930s and 40s, most Japanese towns were made of wood. The buildings, the houses, the residential homes were all made of wood. And so the Americans started carpet bombing Japan, firebombing Japan, burning not one or two, but thousands of, ta of towns and cities in Japan were burned to the ground. These people basically went through hell. And they, the claim is by this author that uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki were also carpet bombed, not nuclear bombed. And he suggests, therefore, that... Um, he has his own arguments for it that nuclear bombs also aren't real. So, The Forest Passage by Ernst Jünger is probably my most, my favorite book. It is a manual for a sort of rebellion that exists outside of organized society. You have to imagine something this way. Imagine you have a proper functioning society, but it becomes corrupt and the corrupt leaders take over. The Forest Passage writes about a certain archetype called the forest rebel, who's like a lone wolf who doesn't like society, lives uh, away from it, lives in the forest, in the woods. But then when the society becomes corrupt, this forest rebel emerges from the forest to basically take on the corrupt leadership. Uh, it's very different from uh, Che Guevara's book on guerrilla warfare. This one is really about the ideological, ideological side of it all of people who still dare to know what truth is, who, who look within themselves to find there what is still of essence, the things that really matter, and then to live by those things and to stand up for those things. And I thought that's a very powerful book, yeah. Um, another book on my list was uh, Empire and Communications by Harold Innes. Uh, this is a, just something like a history book, but it explains how empires work how for example in the western world our minds are trapped in news cycles of 24 hours and you have to stay within those cycles basically to go along with what the governments and the and the empires want you to think about and want you to keep talking about the in these kinds of um, modern empires such as say the u.s empire or the eu or or even china and russia it is the state that determines the topics that may be debated and they the state actually determines the way you may debate these topics. That's why most of these talk shows are very, yeah, they don't really allow uh, truly radical people to speak anything at all. And the news shows and the talk shows, they serve to call people controversial. The media decide who's controversial and who isn't. But they decide this based on some political ideology, you know? Uh, someone asked if I've read David Lane's works. No. No, I have not. I don't know even. I don't even know about this person. But maybe. Uh, maybe I'll check it out sometime. All right. Empire and Communications is a, a book that explains how things like newspapers, media, uh, TV, radio, and so on, how that really is necessary. It's a necessary part of modern uh, empires. Communication is simply. So important to get people on the same page, so to speak. I loved this one, God and Folk, Soldierly Affirmation. Um, this one is published by an anonymous author, but it was probably a well-known German poet who also died in the war against the East at the time. 
it's all a, it's a, it's it's a book it, okay the title is god and folk but it's mostly appeals to the heathen germans of the 1930s of the youngsters that like the teenagers and the 20 year olds 20 year olds who wanted to break away from uh, organized religion but um it essentially talks about you know how the importance of a heroic life so um that can still be valuable to everybody Yeah, the West is collapsing by design, someone writes, and Xenophon writes, you know, they think they can control the result, but they cannot, no, they cannot control it, you know. What's the end goal for me personally? Do you want to be a leader? Yeah, I want to be a leader, yeah. I loved this book as well, God's Battalions, The Case for the Crusades by Rodney Stark. It's simply an unapologetic history of the Crusades, where Rodney Stark, who writes in a very succinct manner, he's very uh, to the point, he explains why these, these men did nothing wrong, they were just fighting for God. They were not fighting against something, but just fighting for God. And uh, he has, of course, a lot of well thought out arguments why we should not be ashamed of the Crusades, but rather embrace them as part of our history and saying that, well, this is who we were and there was nothing wrong about it, you know. Someone mentions David Duke, but I always suspect that he was just another CIA uh, operative. You know, I'm very suspicious of a lot of these American uh, op uh, people, and like Nick Fuentes and so on. I just don't really trust these kind of people. So God's battalions, if you want to get over your uh, hatred of the Crusaders <laughs> and learn to love them, this is the book for you. Uh, I included this book, Handbook for of the Militant Christian by Desiderius Erasmus, my uh, countryman, Desiderius Erasmus, who wrote in the 16th century. And a lot of people think that he was like the, the founding father of multiculturalism in Europe or something, but he wasn't. He was actually someone, he was more like a Christian nationalist, really. And although he um, often argued against war and he was a pacifist somewhat, when war did come to his doorstep at the Battle of Vienna or the Siege of Vienna, I don't know which one it was, uh, the one in 1537, I think, he then promoted Christians to go to war with the Turks, as they were called in those days, the, the, Ottoman, the Ottoman warriors, the Ottoman Turks who were fighting Europe in the heart of Europe. And he said that, um, you know, uh, Christian people should have more children so they can have more sons because... Uh, cannons and, and guns are not just staffed by bullets and bombs, but by the people who operate them. So we need more sons to win the war. He was uh, that kind of Christian, uh, unapologetic. When it, came to, when it came to it, he, uh, he was not ashamed of uh, promoting victory for our people. And he said also that if, if there were any Turks that survived the battle, they should not be harmed, but converted to Christianity. So that tells you a lot about the sort of man Erasmus really was, you know. Intellectuals by Paul Johnson. Yeah, this is this is this book, by the way, is not written in praise of Marx, Tolstoy, Sartre, and Chomsky. No, um, Paul Johnson really fillets Marx in this book. He calls him like a rabid artist who didn't wash himself, didn't clean himself, and never visited a factory. Um, he this book is probably the best deconstruction of Marx himself, the person and of Marx's thought that you will ever find anywhere. <laughs> it's a new york times bestseller as well that's amazing that they even allowed that but you should definitely if you if you are tired of marxism go get this one the whole, the whole section about marx is just fantastic you know yeah i've read all the mustache man's books and, and the speeches and so on there's a four volume uh, collection by max domaris uh containing most of his speeches plus plus commentary i should definitely go through it the speeches are way better than the original <laughs> it cannot be stormed by Ernst von Salomon is a uh, is a novel. This is a fiction novel. It's about the time of the 1930s when the Germans start to unite. It's about uh, the rule a rule setting. You have imagine all these farms in Western Germany, right? And these men don't have cars yet, right? So they have horses. So they meet each other on horseback. They go over to the houses like, hey, what's going on? What's going on? And they talk about the great war against communism and Marxism and so on. Um, this is quite an interesting book, yeah. This is a good novel uh, uh, to read. You know, they always say that um, 
there's nothing about the Jews that would make people jealous of them or something. But it's actually all these things that they say, like Jews are like 60% of the directors in Hollywood. They're like 70% of the lawyers in New York City. And those things are simply true. Those are the facts. And that may play a role in, the, in, in why some people don't like them. So this book is actually published by Harvard University Press. Jews and the New American Scene by Seymour Martin Lipset and Earl Rabb. And it's basically a total admission of the fact that Jews, since their arrival in New York City as a clothing, clothes salesman, uh, they worked their way up into high society, into, uh, you know, high culture. Like Ralph Lauren, for example, was, was a Jewish. Um, the Jews in the USA started by selling clothes. And then worked their way up, but they did it very quickly. And by the mid 20th century, they basically took over many of the political echelons and the power echelons. Uh, and so you see that this book, by the way, describes the process. And it is not some fictional made up story. It's something that just really happened. Uh, here. Main currents of Marxism is also a great breakdown of Marxism. Someone notes here. Uh, what does an ideal economy look like to me? Mm. No, I don't know though. Don't know. Don't have an answer for you right away. Yeah. So this book, Magic. Mm. History, Theory, and Practice by Dr. Ernst Schertel, originally published in German. This is the translation. It, it, it is an introduction to the occult. Uh, and this matters because uh, I'll talk about it later as well. Uh, a lot of people in the United States have been influenced by Blavatsky. Uh, there was a revival of occultism in the late 19th century. 18, late 1800s, right? Late, late 19th century, early 20th century, as well in Germany uh, and many other people. All these elites, the elite cycles, they don't believe in science. They believe in magic. If you're not aware of this, you may start to believe that, you know, we need to trust the science. But the, but the scientists, they listen to the elites who don't believe in science. The elites, they believe in magic. And uh, this book is extremely well uh, argued for the fact that they're for the possibility of actual magic how does it work it means it, this book explains that you know sometimes i don't know if you've ever experienced this a sort of out of body experience where you feel that your mind is not really here but your mind is elsewhere have you ever had such an experience it's called ecstasis or ecstasy ecstasis mean, means literally out of the place from where you are standing if your mind is not here but elsewhere in fact, when we sleep at night, when we dream, our mind can be all over the place in the dream world. But if you, if you manage to achieve this kind of ecstasis where the mind feels like you're like detached from yourself, from your body, so to speak, that is the, the state in which this book argues magic becomes possible. Because if you can use your mind to reimagine the world, to manifest change in the world, you might succeed in it. No. That's the foundation of this book. I, I mention it because, like I said, this is what Western elites believe in. They don't believe in science. The classic Meditations by Marcus Aurelius, of course, the Stoic classic. I think I read this book maybe four or five times because when I was younger, in my when I was around age 30 or so, and it's, uh, it's just a classic. I think it's really good in the sense that... It, I, Actually, I think it contains something that we would now call sort of a sort of Christian Stoicism, but he wrote it uh, apparently a thousand years earlier, right? Joseph Campbell's uh, Myths to Live By, The Hero's Journey, applies to everybody's life, but also to our society's civilizations. And I wonder at what stage have we arrived in the, in the Western world? You know what? I'm going to look up the hero's journey to see if I can determine where we are as a Western civilization. Uh, let's see if it has some images over here. Right, here we go. Okay, call to adventure. We passed that. Supernatural aid. I suppose we've uh, done that. Uh, 
there's a sort of threshold, the beginning of a transformation, well, definitely in the transformation. We go through challenges and temptations, then into the abyss where we have a death and rebirth. Wow, revelation. I think we're there. I, don't, I can't put it on screen, but there's a, there's a thing called the hero's journey. It's like a circle or a cycle that you go through. And halfway through, you reach the abyss where there is a death and rebirth. I think that's where we are as a Western civilization. We are... We are there, yeah. Anyway, this book is useful for you if, you're, if you find your life a bit boring. Here's, a, here's some inspiration to give your life a good twist. This is for men. No more Mr. Nice Guy. A proven plan for getting what you want in life, love, sex, and, and so on. By Robert, Robert Glover. Okay. Robert Glover wrote it. Uh, well, this is a classic work. It basically teaches you that you as a man should not fall into a trap to try to be uh, one of those guys on OnlyFans giving girls money. Right? Don't, don't be like that. Don't do that. Don't give average women extreme praise that they don't really deserve this really helps you balance yourself as in in your expectations from women is that it should be kind of kind of balanced out that what you give her should be kind of balanced out with what you get back from her and if you're not getting back from her then you're just not in a relationship you don't have what you think you have if you are a sort of man who is like a servant to a woman and a lot of men are you may want to reconsider what you are doing with your life because you're not you're not supposed to live that way and it's not healthy for you anyway to be that way you know they say in this world we have a patriarchal world right and that somehow supposedly allegedly means that the men have all the power and the money and the men are in charge but it's it's not true not not in the world of love and and emotional connection and bonding clearly women are in charge of that world and they're using it to get men to work harder for them to give up their wealth for them and i don't think that is the purpose of being a man someone writes about their life story here your life started attending west memphis arkansas right introduced to reality the day you entered okay so you had a, an interesting life then, right? How do you deal and cope with the decline in white America? Well, I don't live in the USA, but, you know, on the other hand. This book, Oriental Despotism by Carl Wittfogel, German author, Comparative Study of Total Power. It explained something, it revealed something to me that I didn't know, is that the Western societies are all very uniquely different from those in everywhere else in the world. The world basically had only one political system called despotism, where a state power ruled with total rule. And that is because most of these other societies are what are called hydraulic societies. It means that the management of water is the primary concern from these societies. Whereas in the Western world, say in um, Northern Europe, you have a lot of rainfall and, that c and you have a lot of streams and so on. It was much more decentralized. Uh, European, Europe has, of course, all these languages and people in it because we are decentralized. Well, same is true for China, of course. China also has many. But the point is, China traditionally always had a state with total power. And so does India and so, does, uh, so do many other places. Whereas uh, the West was unique in the fact that we were anything but despotic all the political systems that you know about nationalism and socialism capitalism and communism uh marxism and liberalism all these and conservatism all these movements were invented by europeans in europe democracy again by europeans in europe the rest of the world was strictly despotic in this sense and this book really opened my eyes about how unique we europeans really are Prussianism and Socialism, another political work. This one's by Oswald Spengler, the author of The Decline of the West. Uh, the Decline of the West is also about the nature of history. He talks a lot about time and space and so on. But here in Prussianism and Socialism, uh, well, Prussianism is a form of nationalism, right? So you can you get the point, right? It's national socialism. Uh, that, but here you come, up, come with a book that questions the very notion of progress. Left-wing people believe in progress, but Spengler asks in this book, well, wait a minute, progress toward what? 
if progress were a road and we were marching down this road and we reached the end of it, then what? Well, then progress is over. So he questions the very, very sense make the, he questions how sensible it is to even believe in progress at all if you don't know where you are going. Right? And that makes sense to me. I love this book, Ship of Fools by C.R. Hallpike, a, an anthology of learned nonsense about primitive society. Again, we have certain conceptions of how primitive life was that it was poor, people were starving, and then we became more modern, and then we had medicine and so on, it was better. Hall Pike says, well, wait a minute, there's actually a reason why primitive peoples didn't want to progress. They didn't want to become modern. Um, he also says that primitive society, which he calls traditional society, uh, d does not normally progress toward what we have today. It's not like it, there is, he, he denies the very notion of progress from uh, primitive to modern. He says, no, we should call it traditional versus modern. And these things coexist next to each other as though they are simply different, totally different concepts. Uh, the traditional people wouldn't want their population sizes to explode too much. So they deliberately set themselves up in a certain way that the surplus of children is basically cold in certain ways. The, the Aborigines of Australia, for example, they used to, you know, beat their babies to death a lot. They did. Uh, and it is, it is a very different concept where you want to try to keep people alive. And then what happens? You get these big cities and you have a different, uh, you need technology all of a sudden. Without technology, we can't survive in the West anymore. And although we decided to keep the children alive, as a consequence, our birth rates have dropped to almost one close to zero now, right? Kurt Vonnegut, American author, he was a soldier during World War II. He was in Dresden when they fire, when the British firebombed the city. Uh, and descriptions of these firebombings are absolutely brutal. First of all, the first people hit by the firebombs were, were actually British soldiers marching around along the river there. Uh, but then the rest of the city caught fire and up to uh, claims are ranged between 30,000 to half a million people were burnt alive during these firebombings of Dresden. And it's not the only city that was firebombed. Uh, Nuremberg was also firebombed. Würzburg was firebombed by the Americans and the British. And the descriptions are so that, well, you know, uh, the, the fires were so hot that the fat from people's bodies turned into liquefied rivers. That's how evil it was. That's what happened to, to these people. And these were mostly women and children, mind you, because uh, Dresden was a safe haven for German women and children. So they, the, the Allies truly, this was genocide. This was a real Holocaust, a real genocide. It's a war crime, yeah. And Uncle Ted, of course. Everybody knows Uncle Ted, right? <laughs> the Unabomber Manifesto, Industrial Society in its Future. I love this uh, Unabomber Manifesto, this little book that was once originally published in a newspaper. I loved it so much because it describes the concept of over-socialized leftists. Uh, it means these leftists are so restricted, by usually by their own upbringing, their parents, for example, so restricted that they... they feel the need to pass this on to other people. And that is why you get people uh, go be, the people who become so hyped up about racism and so on and xenophobia and discrimination uh, because, because it's really over-socialized leftists taking out on society what their parents did to them. You know? Now, this one was a very interesting book by William Calvin, The Ascent of Mind, Ice Age Climates and the Evolution of Intelligence. The premise of this book is that, you know, we call ourselves Homo sapiens, the thinking man, right? Or rather Homo sapiens sapiens, the thinking, thinking man. But this book actually argues that these sapiens minds could not have come out of Africa, but were, but actually evolved in response to the colder climates of the north. So it's, it looks like an inconspicuous book, but it has a very powerful premise here that says that, uh, you know, Homo sapiens developed its mind in response to the cold ice age climates of the north, uh, not of the savannah of Africa, you know. 
The Coming Caesars by Amaury de Riancourt. It's a French author. Uh, this book is written in English. He was very knowledgeable. He foresaw the breakdown of democracies in the Western world and the arrival of Caesars and Caesarism. Because the people generally want to give up. They no longer trust the democratic process. They don't believe in it anymore. And general normal people, normies, will want to give up their responsibilities, personal responsibilities, in favor of a... Uh, brutal dictator in, in favor of a strong man who wants to rule at all cost. And originally I thought this might be Donald Trump, but I think it will actually be whoever comes after Donald Trump. Uh, not necessarily, I don't mean Biden or something, but you can imagine Trump's son, Trump's youngest son, who is six foot seven or so, six foot eight, whatever he is. Uh, he might be uh, a Caesar someday no longer look they say that the united states is a republic i know that but you have democratic elections the united states functions at the federal level as a democracy uh, but this is what's going to go away the whole idea of democracy is going to end and at some point someone with total power will simply take over the usa that is very that's what i expect uh, this book the cult of odin god of death argues that odin was not at first, the king of Valhalla, as it was during the Viking Age. But before that, before the Viking Age, Odin was rather considered a god of death. And the, the people didn't worship Odin because they liked death. They worshipped Odin to avoid it. To hope to appease the god of death so that death would not come to their, their farms. This is an academic work by Stefan Grundy. It's very, uh, very detailed. This is one of the first books I read that really helped me understand something about the world. The Fates of Nations, A Biological Theory of History by Paul Colin Vaux. Uh, he looks at Europe, say the German wars, and he explains the German World War I and World War II as Germany's uh, attempt to create more living space for its people. And he says that this war isn't over yet. He also explains that uh, it will be the richer states of the world, the richer nations of the world, who will start the war on the poorer ones. And then I imagine, well, yeah, that's the Western world. That's Western Europe, the USA, basically the NATO countries who are already allied under NATO will start third world war against the rest of the world. And we see that this is happening. We're, we're, we're engaged with Russia. Okay, we blame Russia. We pretend as a Russia is doing this. But of course, it's the West pushing it. It's the West pushing for these wars. Do you think there's any chance to reverse globalism? Yeah, yeah, of course. I think it will break apart. What's the motive, is, motive of having us believe we all originated from Africa? Uh, universalism, basically. They wanted you to believe in uh, a single origin theory in Eastern Africa. Um, and the idea is then they can make you believe in... If they can make you believe in uh, universalism, then we can have a world government for, you know, we're all one human race, right? But I don't believe that anymore. I believe in the multi-origin uh, human hypothesis. You know, before the 19th century, before this universalism took hold, uh, the scientists of Europe did believe in the multi-origin hypothesis of human origin. They believed that, say, white Europeans and, say, uh, West Africans had their own separate origins, that we did not come from the same uh, single origin in East Africa, which is also very unlikely anyway. I don't believe in the out of Africa theory anymore. Um, I've seen like regular researchers say that perhaps uh, the first humans came out of southeastern uh, Europe, like the area of Bulgaria today. But even they still believe in the single origin hypothesis, and I don't. I think, the, say, the Northwest European type white people compared to the West African black people, I think we have separate origins or largely separate origins, although some admixture must have taken place throughout uh, the millennia. But we have, uh, for starters, simply separate origins. I, I just don't believe in the out of Africa anymore. Yeah, you're from Bulgaria? Well, you may be one of the early humans. <laughs> All right. Uh, I want to answer some more questions because before I run through this. What do you think about white Americans who denounce their own skin color, genetics, and ancestors? That's just silly. Why are you doing this? You know, you know that's probably... Uh, 
So that's something that people with low confidence do. Low confident people deny their accomplishments are real and they deny their successes. And you see, well, white people in general are doing this. We have lo we've become low confident people and we're like in denial of our achievements when actually we are we are we should take pride in, in basically having had the greatest history of any people in the world. And we shouldn't even, we shouldn't even begin to feel ashamed of this. This is just wrong. I love this book too about the horse, the wheel, and language about the Bronze Age riders or the Yamnaya, the Eur Eurasian steppe people, um, who who invented the wheel for their carts. They invented it. The wheel was invented in Eastern Europe, uh, and the oldest wheel ever found was found in Czechoslovakia, I believe, uh, six or seven thousand year old, and it is through these. Indo-European languages, or actually, I don't call it Indo-European anymore. You can just call it steppe pastoralist languages. Uh, that is basically Ukraine and the Pontic steppe and uh, between uh, the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea and so on. And these people, it is through their languages that we have words like axle and wheel and till and steer and so on. All these words for driving and maneuvering a vehicle such as a wagon or a cart come from their languages uh, these, that these steppe pastoralists used to speak. And they deeply influenced uh, Europe and basically became the foundation for you know, the modern world. So it's a very good book by David Anthony, The Horse, the Wheel, and Language. This is a classic by Eric Hoffer, American longshoreman, a working class man who never owned much property. The True Believer, Thoughts on the Nature of Mass Movements. You can find videos of this man on YouTube as well, where he speaks about certain things. I enjoyed this book because it's just very insightful about, uh, he was kind of a right winger too, right? So it's kind of in, very insightful about uh, people. And this was the last book in my list for the right revival, Traditionalism by John Donne. Mm. Traditionalism, the, the only radicalism or the true radicalism. Yeah, and that's probably true. Traditionalism, I heard someone say this morning, is all about uh, you passing on the torch to the next generations. Otherwise, traditionalism is just history. But true traditionalism is a living history that is passed on to your descendants and so on. Right? OK. So I will close this screen for a bit. All right. So I went through a list of 30 books that I recommend for the right revival. I will put this video also on my YouTube channel at The Great Johannes. And maybe I'll spend another uh, 20 minutes interacting with the audience a little bit. At the Great Johannes is my YouTube channel. Uh, let's see if there are some more questions. Yeah, people seem to think it's racist to point out the differences between groups of people, but it's not. It's just observation, right? It's just factual observation. And then at the same time, these people who call you a racist for pointing out differences with, say, West Africans and, and Northern Europeans, they at the same time are Afrocentrists who believe that West African blacks invented modern civilization even though in reality the west african blacks founded no civilization ever they're the only uh, of the 21 civilizations known to historians all 21 were founded not by black people so <laughs> what do you want you know and so what about ancient egypt well ancient egypt was not founded by black people but what about kemet well kemet refers to the black soil of the rhine river of the nile river banks does not refer to black people uh, the Romans, 2,000 years ago, they sometimes buried ancient Egyptians. And the Romans actually made uh, lifelike portraits of these people. Uh, and they, they show you uh, Egyptians who have quite Arabic-looking faces, just as they do look like today. Basically, 2,000 years ago, when, you know, when Cleopatra was around, the Egyptians looked just the way they look like today. They did not look like West African blacks. It's just absolutely ludicrous that, uh, absolutely ludicrous to, for people to think that the West African, the Central West Africans somehow built the pyramids. They did not do that. And there, there's such a, such a debate about this on the internet. It's, it's becoming quite insane. This called this Afrocentrism. You know what, you know what they're doing now? Like they found a few people buried in London 2000 years ago who were uh, who had some North African ancestry. But these people, it turns out, had blue eyes and light hair colors and light skin, but they called them black because they were from Africa. And then in their depictions of these people, 
the way they draw them in the media, they make them look like Central West Africans, like Sub-Saharan Africans, because they're black. So they use the word black. They call anybody from Africa black, and then they say, well, black people are people with frizz hair and flat noses. And even though the people who are, who are actually found in London, who are actually from Africa, uh, they were not, <laughs> they did not have frizz hair. They had straight hair. They had light skin colors. They had blue eyes. <laughs> they were basically, just like when they say that the Moors, the Moors who, in, who invaded Spain, they called them black. But the Moors weren't black. The Moors were more like Arab people. They were not white like me, but they were, you know, a little bit light brown or so. But they were not sub-Saharan African. So the whole this whole Afrocentrist notion is based on the misconception or the misuse of the word black. They call anybody from Africa black. So they say that Egyptians were black. And then they say Egyptians were like, you know, people from Congo or, or, or Nigeria when they were not. It's just so weird, man. Yeah, they even they even claim that the Chinese and the Philippines really are yeah, everybody. Yeah, yeah, Moors were uh, were Arab type people exactly. So, uh, thoughts on Hans Hermann Hoppe's opinion on democracy? I I've heard of this guy, but you know, don't know what he uh, said about democracy. You know, I don't know what he said about democracy. I don't know. I don't know everything. Yeah. Were the Europeans really the first to have slaves? No. The Arabs started the African slave trade. The Europeans took over their trade routes later, but the Arabs started it. And then, of course, everybody else had slaves long before the African slavery, you know. Yeah, I've heard of that, yeah. Asians have some Denisovan, Homo Denisovan DNA, uh, and everybody outside Africa mixed with archaic humans, yeah. But then they say that West Africans are actually up to 20% archaic as well. You see, so the Asians mixed with Homo Denisova, Europeans mixed with Neanderthal, Homo Neanderthal, but the Africans of West Africa mixed with an archaic human, probably Homo erectus. And, um, and a research from India showed that the West African blacks have up to 19% archaic ancestry. Homo erectus or Homo ergaster. Uh, look, just Google Homo ergaster, what, their, what those faces used to look like, and you'll, you'll recognize, oh, basketballers. I think some African peoples had some kind of uh, written uh, writing systems, yeah, but they didn't really write their history, just like the Germanic peoples of the North didn't write their history, even though they had runes. I recently found out there were Celtic runes found in Italy that predate the Latin script by six centuries. And that's interesting because we always say that the Germanics got their uh, runic script by interacting with the Romans, but that's not possible because a very similar Celtic script, which is very similar to the Germanic runes, the Futark, uh, these Celtic runes were in existence six centuries before the Latin script of the Romans ever arrived. And so that means the Germanic peoples, they didn't get their runes from the, from the Romans, they got their runes from the Celtic people. And they got those probably even before, uh, possibly before the Romans even had their own scripts, the Latin scripts. You know? Yeah, Berbers are technically native African whites. It's because, you know, the Mediterranean white people, they lived also obviously lived in northern Africa before the Arabs even came, you know. Someone asked me what I studied that I know so much. I actually read a lot of books. You know, they say you should read a book a day. I don't do that. I don't read a book a day. But I definitely read. Uh, I've read more than 1,200 books so far. It's not much. I, I, I mentioned this as a start. That's not, I know somebody who read over 30,000 books and now, wow, that's nuts. But yeah, if you read a lot and you just always read a lot, then yeah, you, you know a lot. You just stack it up together. This is just my personality. I have this, what's it called? The, the INJF Myers-Briggs personality, the INJF personality. Which is, you're just somebody who just keeps on stacking information and then you try to draw conclusions from that. That's what I do all day, every day, you know, it's just who I am. <laughs> Where am I from? The Netherlands, yeah. Uh, in Norse mythology, it is said that the Vanir and the Aesir gods came from Greece. They traveled north, yeah, maybe. 
there was an interesting research that I read about recently is that in Sweden, southern Sweden, you used to have, first it was populated by hunter-gatherers 7,000 years ago, and then 6,000 years ago, agriculture, the rural agricultural people came along and they replaced hunter-gatherers. And I always imagined like something like that must have been uh, an historical basis for a war between the Aesir and the Vanir, right? And then, of course, 5,000 years ago, the steppe pastoralists, the Yamnaya type people, they came on their horseback and they replaced the agricultural people again in Sweden. So you can imagine there's enough historical foundation for a story about the war between Aesir and Vanir, right? Yeah, my thoughts about 1984 in relation to today's societies. The book 1984 is about Oceania fighting Eurasia. And that's exactly what we are witnessing in reality. You know, we, we have Oceania, that's NATO with the US, the Atlantic people, right? USA and uh, Britain and the NATO allies. That's Oceania against Eurasia. Eurasia, that's, you know, Russia mostly and China. But in the book 1984, Russia fuses with Western Europe to become Eurasia. And this is what our leaders today are trying to prevent. I myself actually favor Germany aligning with Russia. But do you think it's possible that Europe might break apart? Imagine it this way. Britain goes to the USA. They have their sea power, the Atlantic Oceania power, right? And then what if Germany links up with Russia? You have the Eurasia thing as well. But then you also have France and the, the Romance nations like Spain and Italy. France with Spain and Italy together fusing with, say, uh, West Africa. Because France still has uh, 14 African countries under its economic thumbs. And so you can imagine that France would go along. France would have like the Southern European, um, Southern European linked up with Africa, Germany with Russia. Britain with the USA, then Europe would simply fall apart. You know, just because we have this territory in Europe does not mean that there has to be a one single empire controlling Europe. I imagine it can fall apart into, into totally different realities here. The West hates Russia because American economy depends on a weak Russia and a relatively weak Europe. Europe today, Western Europe, is basically the servant of the USA. But if Europe and Russia would unite, then both of them would, would become very wealthy and strong, but at the expense of the USA. Because the United States controls the seas, they control the oceans. And if Eurasia, the land empire between Russia and Germany, would become very powerful, all of a sudden these trade routes overseas become less important now in that scenario, and that will harm the US economy tremendously. Germany still seems far from siding with Russia, though. Yeah, true, because they won't. The United States is in charge of Germany today, and they won't allow Germany to align. That's why they bombed the Nord Stream, after all. Uh, it's a new iron curtain between Russia and the, and, and Europe. Uh, but that doesn't mean it will stay that way forever. You know, it can change. I'm going to eat a little snack, by the way, while I'm doing the podcast or stream. Germans have a long memory. Huh? Will AFD change it? I don't know what the alternative for Deutschland is. I suspect it's a bit of controlled opposition that it's led by Americans in the end. And so they won't. They won't really. The AFD is not going to align Germany with Russia. They they would be shot if they tried to do that. If J if Japan becomes independent again, yeah, I wonder. German media is insane. I can speak German and can read it very well. And German people do not get the same information we get. In Germany, the media said that they should not watch the Putin interview. Of course not. Because Tucker Carlson in the Putin interview admitted that the USA bombed the Nord Stream pipeline. True, yeah. Under Putin, Putin inherited a Russia that had been plundered by the Americans under Yeltsin. And so Putin says to the oligarchs, you can't do this anymore. You have to start working for Russia. So he invests, he forces people to invest in Russia. What happens is under Putin, the salaries of the average Russian people rose by 10 times from 2000 a year to, or to uh, no, yeah, to about, I think they make like $13,000 a year, an average Russian. But it, 
it was 10 times less or 20 times less than that 20 years ago. Russia was insanely poor just 20 years ago. Now they are bourgeois almost, right? 14k, okay. Right, but whatever Putin is doing, it's a threat to the American Jews. Keep, keep this in mind. The Western Jews are not friends with the Eastern Jews. They are in competition for global power. So it's not like they're all one, one unity. They're not. And the question is, what the hell are we going to do? If you're just a goyim, you're a stupid little goat like me, what are we supposed to do? I don't want to be slave to some globalist system. I don't want globalism. I want our people to somehow be able to carve out a future for ourselves without having to submit to global forces anymore. Yeah, Western democracies are not really democracies anyway. We have actors for politicians. Politicians aren't real. Our politicians, they just do what they're told by multi multinationals or whatever. You know? It's just fake. I think Western politicians are all actors, like Macron, Olaf Scholz, Mark Rutter, even Le Pen and Maloney, they're all they're all controlled opposition or fake or whatever, you know, it's all it's all nonsense, you know. I sometimes ate sauerkraut. <laughs> you should eat it with sausage officially. Right? Yeah, elections have consequences as though your go your go in vote will change things. No, of course not. It doesn't change anything. Well, okay. I shouldn't eat in front of the microphone then. Let's just back it up a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good microphone. All right. Uh, yeah, I'll give you my opinions on Trump. Is that I personally I enjoyed him a lot during the 2016 run, but now I think he's just too old, just like all the others. I mean, United States is is messed up. You have ethnic an ethnic rift going on. Everybody hates white people. Everybody wants to take white people's wealth away from them, but they don't automatically have the same competency as the white people the white people still have some things that cannot be taken from them namely competency skill intelligence it's still there but on the way out and so you're being replaced with people who have a full standard deviation lower iq and that means the society that you build cannot be maintained by people with an iq below that you know, the society built by people with an average IQ of 100 cannot be taken over and maintained by people with an IQ of 85. So as soon as the white people are fed up with being treated as demoted second, second rate citizens, uh, then what? They're going to cut loose and go live off the grid. But you're not going to, you know, you can have a big mouth. You can be a bl black mama, have a big mouth and think, are we going to take over this shit? But how are you going to take over if you don't have the skill and the competency to take it over? Because, let me point it out this way. This is something that women also misunderstand. Women think that men have it better because you've got the power positions. You've got the, you are the CEOs of this world. But actually, it's not fun to do any of these things. It's not fun to be an engineer. It's not fun to be a computer coder. You have to be extremely skilled. Sorry, you have to be extremely skilled. You don't make that much money off of it. In, in, in relation to what you are doing for other people, they make a lot more. All right, 
And so you have this situation here that white men have often really sacrificed themselves in their social lives, their love lives, to be really, really good at something that they don't even get that much respect for. And now you, you think that those men are somehow, what? They have the power and the benefits? They don't. These men were sacrificing themselves to keep a society running that they thought they cared about. And a lot of white men, competent, intelligent, high IQ white men, are coming to terms with it and realizing, well, wait a minute, we don't care about this society anymore. This society doesn't care about us. They ne never cared about us. Why do we still bother to keep a, sy a system running that doesn't care about us at all, that hates us, outright hates us? Goodbye, you know? And then what you'll see is that the, the lower IQ generations coming in, they won't be able to maintain the stuff that the white people built up for them. So it's going down. You will see the collapse of it. I mean, or did you really believe that technology just keeps on progressing upwardly? It will always get better. No, it depended on competent people doing so. And when those competent people clock out and realize, okay, this, this whole society is just one fucking scam, you know, the new black leadership, the Black Panther Marxists under Obama, they, they take over. They've got like half of all the mayors, all the big cities. They hate us because we're white, because they think that we were racist toward them, calling them dumb, not that they were actually dumb. Because they were. They were actually dumb. That's why they couldn't do all these things. They, you can't be a surgeon if you're a dumbass. You know? And so it's going down. It's over. It's over. Western... Uh, type American civilization is going to become something like they have in Africa. It's just going to be like a, a copy of the third world in Africa. That's what it's going to be. You're going to have the same kind of black narcissistic rulers who will spend more money on partying than on infrastructure. Because the engineers who used to work on this infrastructure, the white guys, the old white guys, they're clocking out and they don't, they don't give a damn about a society that hates them anymore. So, and there's no one to replace them. So, Game over, you know. All right, I'm going to uh, stop this, and I'll put this video on my YouTube channel at the Great Johannes. You can also get my uh, my uh, what's it called? JMK.info newsletter, my Substack newsletter. Uh, please subscribe if you can afford eight dollars a month. I will send out a newsletter like regularly, and uh, or you can buy my books on Amazon, like Revival of the West. Okay. See you. Bye-bye.